Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our anniversary Sunday. And uh, there's always some debate as to exactly when the church started. If you go by the city permits, it's 62 years since we got the permit for this building. That's why you have 62 on the sheet. But if you look at some of the plaques in the back or you talk to some people, some of the meetings started the year before. So you could say 63 years. But um, uh, there's lots of interesting stories, and I encourage you to talk to some of the older people about that. But uh, this church has seen good times and bad times. It's been everywhere from growing all the way to over 200 people down to 15 people, back up to what we are today. And it, uh, God has been faithful to us over the years as this church began in what was then a new area of town. And so we are thankful to God for his graciousness and his goodness. And we've seen many missionaries and refugees sponsored and pastors come through and parachurch organizations helped through this church. And this church continues to serve this city and our world. And so thank you all for coming. We're happy to have Cornell Van Eyck as our speaker this morning, Cornell has been a faithful servant of God for many years and has been a friend of this church for many years as well. We do have a luncheon afterwards. I encourage you, even if you didn't come prepared for that, you, there's lots of food and you're welcome to stay and join us for lunch afterwards. Uh, just a few announcements. The baby dedication is, gonna, is being moved to the 19th. And that same Sunday, there'll be a, just a short uh, congregational meeting to vote on our amended constitution. Uh, the council meeting is not the, the seventh, as in your bulletin, but the 14th. So keep those things in mind. And we have a couple videos to play, and then, get, or do you want to say something first or after? Okay, so we're going to play the one first, and then Gabriel will say something, and then the second one. a weak man um, I see a nameless faceless woman that we never actually get to know we just see her through the lens of the men in the story and a lot of people doing what they think is right in their own eyes and it's really bad and it ends badly really badly for her. I mean, it just, it, it's a very unusual story and very unusual people interacting with that story. It's certainly not what you expect when you think of, uh, I mean, a holy book uh, talking about God's people and then you find out this is in the midst of it and literally you have people really behaving badly and um, it, it, it's very, what, shocking. Because as, as much as we think that was back then, uh, I think it was very shocking for even them uh, at the time. If it was a movie, it would be an X-rated movie for sex and violence. It's just wrong on so many levels. I mean, the people, it's not just behaving badly. They're behaving horrendously. I mean, this is awful stuff. Yeah. Right? Terrible. It's just terrible. But it, it's real. All right. Is everybody intrigued? <laughs> Come on. <coughs> Is everybody intrigued already? Who can tell me what story they're referring to? Besides those who were part of this whole thing. Anyone? Sir? Ha, that's actually a good one, but no. <laughs> All right, so what we're trying to do, we're trying to explore a few things. People don't read the Bible anymore. They listen to the social media people. They listen to the TVs. They listen to radios. But they don't read the Bible. They watch videos, though. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to explore certain themes in the Bible and engage the people out there. Actually tell them. This is not, because oftentimes when people talk about the Bible, it's misrepresented. And so we're trying to engage the stories ourselves and share what, we, what we're doing with, uh, 
with the world out there. So look forward to check out our Facebook page. There's going to be more. Trust me, it's way juicier than this. So anyways, uh, in the next few weeks, uh, you'll be seeing those videos coming up online on Facebook. And uh, if you want to check out our Facebook page or you want to know how to get to the Facebook page, talk to me. Talk to Rita. Rita's been on there, Leslie, and a few other people. All right. Good morning, Northmount. All right, there's one more video. Uh, over the next eight weeks, we're starting a, disciple, a church discipleship program. Oftentimes people say, oh, I know God. But when you hear them talk about God, you're like, no, that's not the God I'm serving. And so over the next eight weeks, we'll be exploring. And every Sunday, there will be a video that will be played here. So I'm going to play the trailer for you, and I'm going to walk through a few of the things we'll be exploring there. God plays an important role in all of our lives. But have you and your family ever wondered what God is really like? Who He really is? Is it something you've ever really explored together? If you're like a lot of families, the subject of who God is isn't exactly like conversation material. It might seem confusing to your kids or hard to keep their attention. Not to mention we're all so busy, just finding the time to talk with your kids can be challenging by itself. Well, that's why we developed the Real God series, a completely free online resource you can use to engage your kids by exploring who God really is, how we can know Him better, and what He really thinks about us. This fun, eye-opening series will provide answers to questions like, how should we really think about God? And what is God's purpose in our lives? What is God doing to reward good people? And why aren't bad people always punished? You'll explore God's wisdom, how He sees the big picture, even when we can't, and how we can always count on His promises, even when things aren't going our way. So come join us, reclaim time with your family, and see how loving, good, and just God really is. Come learn more about the real God. There will be uh, pamphlets out there uh, just to show you where to go to online to get the videos and to download this discussion guide. I can t tell you they're really wonderful videos. I mean, there's one about a vending machine. God, a vending machine? Anyways, I think it's really interesting. So, uh, starting next week, we'll be playing the uh, videos every Sunday. And um, starting this week, actually, we'll be starting the Bible study on Wednesday night. So we start at 7 p.m. We start with prayer, and 7.30 we start the um, Bible study. So this Wednesday night, we're starting the study on God, the real God. It's going to be an eight-week study. So if you want to join us, feel free to join us. And this is some of the topics we'll be exploring. And I know Greg is like, Gabriel, get out of there. <laughs> so this is some of the topics we'll be exploring. Seeking God, the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God. The holiness of God, the wisdom of God, the justice of God, the love of God, and finally, the faithfulness of God. Amen? Thanks, Gabriel. Just, uh, I just want to point out one other special guest this morning. Uh, Jim Hanks is here, and Jim is one of the, is the only remaining charter member of this church that's still living, and we're excited to have you here this morning, and his son, Robert. So thank you for coming. And uh, Margaret Clark was just telling me how uh, Jim and his wife, Nancy, were one of the first ones to greet their family when Margaret Clark came to this church. And they were really the bedrock of this church, along with about 12 others who began the church together. So thank you for your faithfulness in this church. Let's pray together as we begin our service, shall we? Lord, it is so good to not just um, get excited about all the memories, but to get excited about you and what you have done in this community and your faithfulness over many years. And so it's to you that we come to this morning in praise and adoration for all you have done for your grace in many people's lives, the many people's lives who have been touched and who have come to know you through the ministry of this church. 
that many people have gone out from here and they're serving you around this world because of your faithfulness here. And so we thank you for your goodness. Just go before us as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Vic. Going to get you to stand and we're going to sing Amigos de Cristo. We're friends of the Lord. Number 476. Amigos de Cristo, we're friends of the Lord. Amigos de Cristo, we're friends of the Lord. For we have been given and we've been free. Amigos de Cristo, we're friends of the Lord. Friends of the covenant renewed each morn. When Christ in loving we've been reborn. Gift of the dove for us and evermore. Amigos de Christos, we're friends of the Lord. Amigos de Cristo, we're friends of the Lord. Amigos de Cristo, we're friends of the Lord. Please remain standing. Our call to worship, number 471, a glorious church. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. For, for us. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself 
a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Amen. Let's continue singing. Turn to number 434. 434, revive us again, and we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Sing, uh, just watch the screen, Refiner's Fire. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart. As gold, pure gold, the finest fire, my heart's strong desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be. And make me holy, purify my heart, cleanse me from my sin, deep within, refine as fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you. apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Thank you. Be seated, please. It's time for us to pray together. And I just thought I'd share with you one really neat thing that... Uh, I saw God working in this week. I went to visit Enid Brown. Uh, many of you know Enid, she's like 98, and she's been at the Glenmore Care Center, but she just recently, this week, got moved to Bellevue Manor. 
And uh, when I went to visit her, that is also the place where Marjorie Stauffer, who used to live just around the corner, has also been moved to. And uh, what I discovered is they are right next to each other. And so I was able to visit both of them and tell the nurses, hey, these ladies went to the same church and they know each other, so introduce them. So now they're both hard of hearing, so it'll be interesting, but um, they can sit together in meals and different things. So just pray for some of our seniors in these places that uh, still feel a part of us, but are not able to get here all the time. Let's bound prayer, shall we? Lord, I just thank you so much for the way you are continually orchestrating and building your church wherever we are, that we are one, we are a body. And I think of all the people that uh, are associated with this church who may not even be here this morning. I think of the Stevensons, and I think of Doris Pentegrass, and Diane Smith, and many others. God, I just pray you'd bless them this morning and watch over them. And Lord, I just pray for each person that is here this morning. It's not an accident that you have called us to this place. You have brought us here. And you are building your kingdom. And you have called us to serve alongside you in sharing your love to all our neighbors and those people around us who desperately need to hear words of love in an age that is so messed up. God, I just pray that as we worship together, as we fellowship together, as we share with each other, that each one here would be encouraged, would be challenged by you, and would go out from here a better person because of your presence in their lives and in ours. God, I just pray that you would carry on building your church for the next 60-some years. Thank you for your faithfulness. It is only because of your faithfulness and your grace that any of us are here at all and have the freedom to worship. Go before us. We just pray as you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Shirley Ann has a little talk for the kids. So all the kids want to come to the front. You can, you can drag one of your parents up if you need to. But uh, come on up. Come on up, guys. What? You okay? Okay, so what do you see in my hand? What are oh, oranges. oranges. Great. Is that a big orange? It is a big orange. What? And what's on the outside of the orange? What do we call this part? Orange. We call it the peel, right? Peel. Yeah. Now, what happens if we put the orange in the water? Whoa! Whoa! It gets bigger. No, it doesn't get bigger. But it's what's what's it doing? <coughs> It's floating, you're right. It's floating. And it doesn't matter if it's a big one like a grown up or a little one like a kid. It will float. The water, the water represents the world around us and our circumstances. And sometimes there's lots of things that can happen during your week. When you're going to school or you're going to the babysitter or wherever, things can happen to you. But if we have God, if we have God protecting us, then even though we're in the circumstances, God protects us and we stay floating. But if we start saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't need to listen to my parents. And so we take some of the peel off. We take some of the protection away. It's like, I, I don't have to read the Bible. Protection away? We're taking more protection away. I don't have to go to church. I can do just fine on my own. I don't need those people. A lot of them really kind of irritate me. I'm staying home. We take more protection off. And it's like, I I don't need to listen to the pastor. What does he know? 
careful. <laughs> we take more protection away. I don't have to memorize Bible verses. I don't need, I don't need those verses in my life. Well, when we take all that protection away, it sinks. It sinks. It gradually sinks to the bottom. It's not protected anymore. And if we were to take it out, look at that. It's not holding. Whoop. <laughs> it's not holding together anymore because it's lost its protection. And it's just, it's not able to deal with the circumstances anymore. It just sinks right to the bottom. So we could do that to this too, but we won't. It takes longer to peel. What I want you guys to remember is that we need, we need God's protection in the world. Because there are a lot of things out there that aren't very much fun and they're hard to live through. But when we have God's protection, it keeps us from sinking in all those negative things that can happen to us. And it protects us. But I can float. That is excellent. I'm glad you can float. And you can float in the world too if you keep God's protection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these young people. I pray that you would help them to remember that, that you are real, that you are their protection, and that you keep them safe, and that they can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Aren't kids fun to watch? <laughs> the story's pretty cool, too. It's time for this morning's offering, if the ushers would like to come to the front. Stand together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures in the Praise Him, all the Praise Father, Son, and Holy may be seated. We've come this far by faith, 
don't be discouraged with trouble in your life. He'll bear your burdens and move all the discord and the strife. Well, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in His holy word. He's never failed us yet. Oh, we can't turn back. We've come this far by faith. Just remember the good things that he has done. Things that seemed impossible. Oh, praise him for the victories he has won. We've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord, trusting in His holy word, He's never failed us yet. Oh, we can't turn back, we've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith. Good. And how do you turn the light on? Okay. And also, I realize I'm taller than Vic and my husband, but I am cheating. I have two inch heels on. <laughs> so, I want to say thank you for praying for me while I was gone last week, um, laying my brother in law to rest. I felt your prayers, and I appreciate having a church family behind me. Um, when I was reading this, preparing for Luke 24 13 to 35, I realized in reading it that I could kind of relate or just maybe at least appreciate this story because um, at certain points, God purposely keeps the people in the story, their eyes closed. And I thought about my own life of times where I felt like I couldn't see the truth correctly, but at eventually when the time was right, I could see what was really happening, what had happened. And I think God does that on purpose because he knows when we can handle things. So, Luke 24, 13 to 35. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the th pro things the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen, has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. Amen. I'll have you stand again, and uh, we'll sing from the screen. It's not in your books. You'll have to go to the screen. And this is one we introduced a little while ago. And so I hope you, uh, I know when you have done the first verse, it'll come back to you. It's a very easy tune to remember. So uh, will you come and follow me? going to come and share with us. I just want to share one more thing about Cornell. He's a pastor. He's 83, retired a long time ago, but he's still working all the time, interiming at different churches, speaking at different churches like he's doing here this morning. He really is a true servant of God's word. So thank you, Cornell. Come and share with us. Thank you for asking me. 
Greg to speak today. Diana, thank you for reading the scripture, well read. I, they say, it said in a bulletin, I'm retired. Uh, I don't know what that word means. I've had three retirement parties already. When I turned 65 and I left Youth for Christ, when I was 70, when I left Sunrise, and I was retired from Crescent Heights. So the three parts, they're getting better. <laughs> I'm waiting for the fourth one. <laughs> That's going to be a real good one. <laughs> I believe, not as a pastor, but as a Christian, you never stop working. You never stop ministering. It's a privilege that we called to do so. You know, I, uh, I appreciated your children's story about the orange. Talk about Craig this week. He said, Cornell, I forgot, but we also have the Lord's Supper. <laughs> uh, could you keep it within? Uh, and then he said, no, never mind. <laughs> and I'm glad he did, because I started cutting away on my message. And... Hearing that children's story, that's exactly the way my message felt. I kept cutting away on it, and the more I cut away, I realized I'm taking away the real message. So here we go. Robert Burns. Robert Burns has written a beautiful little poem, and the name of the poem is John Anderson, my Joe. And in this poem, a wife is speaking to her husband. She speaks of the hills that they've climbed together, and now, as they near the end of their journey, she says they soon will rest together at the bottom of the last hill. And as you read this poem, you can almost feel the sweetness of the long walk, the long journey that they've taken together over the years. But let me tell you something better. The sweetest walk of all is to walk with Jesus. In my message this morning, it's a story of two men who walked with him after his resurrection from the grave. And these men were walking toward the house in Emmaus. And they were complaining, lamenting the death of Jesus on the cross. But suddenly, he, Jesus, was walking by their side. He was full of life. And he did, they did not recognize him. And in their wildest dreams, they could not believe that the one they had seen die could be alive again. That's impossible. And Jesus asked them why they were so sad. Why are you crying? And I told them of their grief and their disappointment that this was not the one who would have redeemed Israel. So Jesus, in a marvelous way, opened up the scriptures and explained how the promised Messiah would come and suffer and be crucified for the sins of the world. And the amazed man then came to the home and in true Eastern habit fashion, they invited the intriguing stranger to come in and spend the night with them. And Jesus accepted the invitation and they soon sat down to supper. And he asked a blessing. And as he prayed, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But when they looked up, he had disappeared, departed from the sight. And then they said one to another, we're not our hearts burning within us 
while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And then they ran back to Jerusalem. They couldn't wait to get back to the friends and tell them the story. Tell them all that had happened. Now these two men loved Jesus very much. And of course they were sad because he'd been crucified. No sadness is a common, a common lot of all of us. If you have not had a great sorrow in your life as yet, you can be sure that it will come to you someday. Jacob's brother, a favorite son, Joseph, whom he had loved with all his heart, but Joseph's jealous brothers, they sold him into slavery and reported to Jacob that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal and, and presenting Joseph's bloody coat of many colors as proof that he indeed had been killed. And in his great sorrow, Jacob wept and said, I'll go down to my grave in sorrow. David also had a favorite son, Absalom. He was a handsome young man with charm to win friends and, and influence people. And in his desire for power, he raised up an army against his father. That army was unsuccessful. And as Absalom fled away from the battle, his beautiful hair got caught in the low hanging branches of the tree. And as he hung there, Joab rode up to him and plunged three arrows in his heart, killing him instantly. When the news of his death reached Jacob, we see one of the saddest stories pictures in the Bible. Old David climbed up his, to his chamber over the gate, and as his heart broke, he sobbed, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for you? Absalom, my son. And he began, we see the sadness and in the little town of Bethany near Jerusalem, there was a home where Jesus loved to visit. And in that home lived three dear friends, Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. And once when Jesus was away on a preaching mission, death came to the home. Lazarus became ill and died. And four days later, when Jesus returned, he found the two sisters overcome with grief. Now, Jesus knew that Lazarus was dying. And where he was, was very close to Bethany. He could have made it probably in one day. But it was four days later that Jesus showed up. There was a reason for that. And that's my next message. Not today. Four days later when Jesus returned, he found the two sisters crying. He was so moved with compassion for them that we see his human side taking over. And we read the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we should remember that he is always moved with our sorrows as well. There are many other instances of sadness in the lives of those who, who make a, a biblical story. And the older that you and I become, the more sadness comes in our lives. I visited a lady 
uh, she turned 104 years old. And I asked Aileen, Aileen uh, how are you doing? God is good. I'm doing well. She is as bright as you can imagine. She has his only one problem. I'm alone with the Lord. I had no more friends. They're all dead. No more family. They're all dead. I don't know why God is keeping me here, but there must be a reason. It says, there, there is, you're praying for me, aren't you? Every day. You know, I'm not the four years old, still serving the Lord Jesus. You know, for the last number of years, I've lost a lot of friends and a lot of family members. I lost my father. And shortly thereafter, I lost my mother. And she always prayed, Lord, don't let me die. Don't let me get Alzheimer's. If you want me that badly, just give me a heart attack. And that's what happened. She had a heart attack. Not that long thereafter, my youngest sister died. She died of cancer. And within the last month, my other sister passed away. She died of Alzheimer's. I never thought you could. So we all have our moments of grief, don't we? Dr. Vance Hafner was one of the greatest, and he was one of the most unusual preachers. He didn't get married until he was about 40 years old, but his wife was one of the sweetest and the most lovable women ever to live. That's after my own wife. They were married for 33 years. She traveled with him wherever he went, and she looked after his every need. She was a marvelous companion and, and comforter to him. And they continued all these years in a great love they found when they married. And then she was stricken by a dreaded disease and lingered only five months before her death. And he wrote in a letter to a good friend of two striking things. He said, you don't know what it's like until you've been there. How true that is. Preachers try their best to comfort others in their sorrow, but they don't really know what it's like until the angel of death knocks on their door. And he also said, a thing is not lost if you know where it is. And so we really have not lost our loved ones where we know that they are waiting for us in heaven, do we? And that we'll soon see them again. Dr. Carl Green was a a pastor of a Baptist church in Georgia. And early one Sunday morning, two military men came to his home to tell him that a son had been killed in Vietnam. And although their hearts were broken, his wife taught Sunday school that morning, and he preached at a regular service. And this is what he said. We preach that God's grace is sufficient. And now we have an opportunity to show by our lives that God can sustain in the hour of sorrow. Although this world is a veil of, of tears, the Bible tells us that God shall wipe away all tears. 
The psalmist said that, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now Jesus, back to the story, joined these, these two men as they walked along, but they didn't recognize him. Their eyes were affected in such a way that they did not know him. But the Bible does not explain why or how. It's said that he is a stranger to many people today. They go the way and buy and sell, eat, drink, and having a good time. But never giving Jesus a thought and never realizing the need that they have for him. And thank God he's no stranger to the Christian because he has met him at the cross. And life grows sweeter day by day as he walks and talks with him. Don't ever forget the day that you met Jesus. Who were these men who walked with Jesus? Who were they? Well, the name of one was Cleopas, and the name of the other is not given. And you know, Jesus had a great ministry. He had a helpful ministry to the nobodies, to the unknown, the nameless ones of the world. Not the rich, the great, the educated, but to anyone who had a need for him. He saved me when I was certainly a nobody, just out of love for a lonely man. We read in John 4 how he dealt in compassion with a prostitute, a nameless woman of the street. In John 5, we read how he healed a man who had been afflicted for 38 years with an awful disease. A nobody in the community. In John 9, we see how he gave sight to a blind man whose name was unknown. And in Mark 4, we are shown how he healed a man who was brought before him by four of his friends. But the names are never given. And on the cross, he took the hand of a guilty thief and he led him into paradise. He was just a poor, unnamed criminal. He ministered to the little people of the world, but they were great in his sight. And so is every needed creature today. We are all big, great in his sight. The disciples were in a fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee, and it, and it seemed that their condition was hopeless. But Jesus came walking on the water, and he said, It is I. Don't be afraid. And today, when the storm of life overwhelms us, he comes again and he says again, It is I. Don't be afraid. I'll always be with you. Thank God. He's no stranger to those who have trusted him. He walks with us every day, saying, these are mine. I'll never leave them nor forsake them. I make all things work together for their good. Now, when Jesus asked these men why they were so sad, they answered, you know, we trusted that this one who was crucified would be the one to redeem Israel. But now he's dead. He's been dead for three days. And in John 1 verse 11 tells us that he came into his own and his own did not receive him. Why did they reject him? 
why so many people are rejecting him today? Why did they not receive him? Well, there are two lines of prophecy running through the Old Testament. One telling of a coming king and the other of a suffering savior. But before the Messiah could be king, Jesus told these men that he must first suffer. Now, the Old Testament people did not understand this. They thought that Messiah would come as a conquering hero, a king. But when he came as a suffering savior, they didn't recognize him. He was a lowly birth. He was raised in an obscure village. His family was poor. His father was a carpenter. And, and I'm sure Jesus was a good help to his father. He said that he had no place to lay his head. And so looking for a mighty king, they didn't recognize or recognize him. And the other line of prophecy showing him coming as a king is yet to be fulfilled. And one day the skies will open and he will come in all the glory of his father. I remember a number of years ago I attended a, a, a concert by, he's a Dutchman too, I, I can't remember his name. Ryu? Uh, Andre. And he appeared at the Saddle Dome. And uh, it was a wonderful evening. But to finish the evening, he played the Hallelujah Chorus of the Messiah. It was so majestic that people were crying and raising their hands. And I looked at the ceiling expecting the ceiling to open and the Lord Jesus to appear. It's going to be a mighty, mighty time when the Lord Jesus comes back. But no one knows the day nor the hour of their coming. And Jesus said to these men, oh fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Don't you know that Christ must suffer first before he becomes a king? You know, they could see a throne, but they weren't able to see a cross. And it would be the same with us if he came as a, as a humble peasant today. A religion without a cross and blood is a false religion. The Bible says without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission. There's only one who can save us. The one who shed his blood for us. An old saint lay dying and a priest came, came to see him. And the priest felt that no one could get into heaven unless he opened the gates first for him. And he said, I've come to, to grant absolution to you. And the old man said, what? I've come to forgive you your sins, replied the priest. And the old man said, may I look at your hands, please? And when the priest extended his hands, the godly man said, you're an imposter. The one who forgives my sins must have the prints of the nails in his hands. Don't be a supposer, thinking that anyone else or anything else can save you. It's Jesus only, only Jesus. Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So Jesus went all the way back to Moses and explained the scripture to these men, and they understood. 
They know then that these prophecies have been fulfilled and a new hope sprang up in the hearts. Now you don't have to understand all the Bible, although it's good if you do, but you don't have to understand all of the Bible to be saved. You need only to know that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ can save you and died for you. Praise God. When these men came to the gate, the two men invited Jesus to come and spend the evening with them. He accepted the invitation, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread, he blessed it, and gave thanks. As he gave thanks, something happened in the way that, that he prayed. That's what made him known to them, that it was Jesus. But when they looked up, he had vanished, he had disappeared. And the thing that made them recognize him reminds us the way that we live makes often, makes others often see Jesus. You can see Jesus as you read your Bible. You can see him in some great, some great service. When Pastor Greg is preaching, I'm sure you always see Jesus. If not, you should. You can see him in nature. You know, it's more meaningful when someone says, you know, I saw Jesus in you. Oh, if we all lived the kind of lives that we should for Christ, that when people look at us and they see a little bit of Jesus in us, many more people will be influenced by our Christianity, by a what? When Jesus disappeared, these two men said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he walked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they couldn't wait. They said, Let's go and tell the others what happened. And so they rushed back to Jerusalem and told the story of what had happened. And oh, when you see me, Jesus, and your heart burns with love for him. You want to tell someone else about it? My oldest daughter was saved in the daily vacation Bible school. She accepted the Lord. And that evening or that afternoon, she came home. And she disappeared to her room. And shortly thereafter, she came out of her room. She said, Mommy, Daddy, I have to go out for a minute. And my wife said, uh, why, Cindy? And she had a little Bible in her hand. She said, I got to go and witness. I got to tell my neighbors about Jesus, a 10-year-old girl. God has given us the light of the gospel. As we let us shine, our part of the world will be lit. When our lights for Christ don't shine, our part of the world is dark. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let it shine. We have in Christ all that the world needs. We don't need any more than Christ. In a certain battle, a wounded man was able to drag himself into his tent and where he died, and they found him on the ground with his Bible open in his hand, and, and his fingers were, were glued to one verse in the 11th chapter of John, where it said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever, whoever liveth 
and believed in me shall never die. That's the kind of religion that I want. I want a Savior who will wash away all my sin. I want one who will cause my heart to burn within me as I walk with him on the pathway of life. I want one I can recommend, I can recommend to others. I want one who can sustain me. When I come down to die and take me home to glory. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the two disciples, Lord, that you met up with and explained to them what had happened and what was going to happen. And Father, I pray that as we go our different ways, as we walk, that we not just walk, but that we could say, I walked with him, I talked with him. That, Father, we can, that we can rely on the Lord Jesus to help us through difficult times. If there's anyone here who's going through a tough time, I pray, Father, that you will speak to that person. And, Lord, that you will give me the confidence that all things will work out well if we have Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Father, as we leave here today. I pray that we too can say to whoever we're with, did not our heart burn within us? Thank you, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Cornell. As the, we close, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Um, as the, our leaders are coming, let's just remain seated, and we're just going to sing um, number 463. I'll remember the, and we'll just sing the first and the second verses. The first and the second verses. Let's sing this together. According to thy gracious word in the meek humility, this will I do, my dying Lord, I will remember thee. Thy body broken for my sake, my bread from hell shall be thy death. Every time Jesus came to the table, lives were changed. If you notice that in the scripture, every time he gave thanks and broke bread, lives are changed. And we have a beautiful opportunity to share what God has done for us through his broken body that changed us all forever. We wouldn't be here this morning if it wasn't for Christ and what he's done. Let's just pray and thank God for his broken body for us. Lord, I just thank you that just like those two men on the road to Emmaus, when you broke bread together with them, their eyes were opened. And I pray this morning that as we celebrate your goodness through your broken body, you would remind us again and again through the coming days all that was changed through your broken body. And so, Lord, we just celebrate this in thankfulness for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat it together. I imagine that those men on the road to Emmaus, they ate that meal together and they're their eyes were opened. I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that Jesus was there. And when they saw him pray, they saw the incredible love and the relationship with his father that came out that they know only Jesus could be praying like this. We have an incredible God who shed his blood for us. Let's thank God for his shed blood for us. Lord, I just thank you so much that You sacrificed everything for us to the point where you died. And even though many people were sad when you died, millions more rejoiced when you came back to life because you are alive forever. And through your death, you have saved us forever completely. All our sins, past, present, and future, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus said, this is an eternal covenant. I'm committing myself forever. This is my, body, my blood shed for you. Let's drink it together. In closing, I'd like us all to stand and we're going to sing number 657, Cleanse Me. And we're, we'll just sing the first and the third verses, the first and the third verses of Cleanse Me. And just make this a time to recommit yourself to God from his faithfulness as we stay faithful to him. Let's sing together. Search me, O oh God. Thank you for each person here. Thank you for the challenge this morning. I pray that you would just set our hearts on fire. Lord, thanks too for this food that we're about to share together. Just bless it and help us to serve you better through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go in his peace, in his grace, and let's share Jesus, sharing all that he has spoken through the scriptures so that other people's hearts will burn on fire. For Jesus, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit.